beyond all the odds, beyond all the delays, and beyond even my own expectations, Hogwarts Legacy finally landed at the start of February 2023. Apart from if you're on Xbox One, PS4, or Nintendo Switch, literally good luck running this game. And to be honest, it's pretty good. It got positive reviews, runs mostly well, and has reignited the spark of nostalgia in the minds of Potter fans. Hell, even IGN liked it. Like many, I've been waiting for a truly excellent Harry Potter game since I was in the third grade. Um, babes, don't we already have that perfect game? While the book and film fans, no doubt, form the majority of people playing Hogwarts Legacy, desperate for a game that invites them back into the magical realm of Hogwarts and beyond, the old Harry Potter games invited a whole generation of fans into the castle, and honestly, playing them are among my most formative gaming memories, and so, for us. That's right, I'm including you, my dear viewer. Don't think you're getting away from this. Hogwarts Legacy had a lot to live up to, not least due to the large variety of games that were spread over the years, platforms, and console generations. So I thought, what better way to compare the old games to the new than with a fight to the death? So ladies and gentle thems, please take your seats for tonight's entertainment. And for those of you in the front row, there will be a splash zone. You have been warned. Some housekeeping before we begin. Obviously, there's going to be some spoilers in this video. Nothing too major. I'm not going to go into any of the major plot points. But if you wanted to go into the game with a fresh set of eyes, then look away. Tonight's battle will be split into separate categories to give each competitor a fair fight. And while there may or may not be crowned a victor, just know that tonight's battle is just a bit of fun. It's just a bit of fun, really. The competitor or competitors for each round may be selected from amongst the best in that category. And while some of the games are rated very highly in their weight class, some games are obviously not really highly rated in any category at all. Looking at no games in particular, I'm sure. And finally, if turfs and bigots could please make their way to the nearest exits, there will be no re-entry into the venue tonight, no refunds, thank you kindly. And with that, may the fight begin. The older Harry Potter games varied a lot in their gameplay. Like, why did we get Call of Duty Deathly Hallows, a hack and slash goblet of fire, and a Game Boy JRPG Harry Potter game with a thick as f <laughs> snake? But generally, the games present a light-hearted action-adventure style with a big focus on exploration. The early games on both PC and console were essentially full-on 3D platformers, with each version doing the platforming part with various levels of success. <laughs> Harry and the others would go to class, learn spells, complete spell challenges, use those four to eight spells in story missions, all whilst eating a <laughs> ton of beans, cauldron cakes, and chocolate frogs along the way. Honestly, it's a miracle no one had a heart attack or gained an eating disorder or something. The early games were pretty linear in terms of story, but with some freedom to explore Hogwarts between classes and missions. For me, the spell lessons were the highlight, or at least the PC game spell challenges were. I cannot condone the endless gore as the PS2 spell lessons were. Later on, the games had a bit more freedom in the order of completing tasks, like gathering the Order of the Phoenix, but nothing full-on RPG like we get now with Hogwarts Legacy. Unlike the earlier games, the whole castle is basically explorable from the start, and random students throughout are desperate to receive your help with dumb tasks like retrieving a rusty slimy magic telescope from the Black Lake, or finding a bunch of gobstones that really she should go and get herself lazy. No, I don't care that you're too young to learn, Akio. Don't you know who I am? Full of herself. So no Absolutely full of herself. Haven't you any friends at school? We are Not literally really. bullying this child. Not as we should. We also have the vast grounds of Hogwarts and beyond eager to be explored. Trust me when I say I was in shock the first time I zoomed out the map. Now, this might be cynical of me, but it does feel like Portkey, Avalanche, Warner Brothers went down the more popular, generic route when it comes to the gameplay, rather than going for something more adventurous or unique. The Witcher 3 seems to be a big influence on the more open world RPG aspects of the game. Some of it I don't think especially suits the world of Harry Potter, like the outfits having legendary and uber epic cool sleigh written on their descriptions, like it, it just doesn't fit for me, and definitely just feels like them going well, other games are doing this, so we have to do this too. Hogwarts Legacy is also trying to be a lot of other different games at once, like Animal Crossing, The Sims, Pokemon, Zoo Tycoon, Dark Souls, Bloody Cooking Mama. 
okay, okay, I'm obviously being a bit facetious and dumb, but the point is, there's a lot going on. Probably to try and appeal to as many types of player as possible, from those who want to explore the big, wide, wizarding world universe, to those who literally never want to leave the safety of their little Hogwarts hangout. Personally, I would have preferred if they stuck with one genre and committed, rather than constantly tell the player more and more exciting things they can do in the world. First, you'll need to use this spellcraft to conjure an enchanted loom. An enchanted loom. But I know other people may disagree with me on that one. And honestly, fair enough to Porky. This is the biggest Wizarding World video game for a good while. I'm not gonna pretend I'm in love with the gameplay. I personally much prefer the platforming adventure of the PC games, although compared to the console games, Hogwarts Legacy is definitely a step up in many ways. Overall though, it wouldn't really be fair to judge the old games by their stories, as they were obviously limited by the source material, but good on them for keeping peeves in. <laughs> However, one thing they can be held to account for is the way that they tell those stories. While they got the general message across, various parts were cut, and the timeline of events sometimes didn't really make sense, even between different versions of the same game across multiple platforms. Like in Chamber of Secrets PC game, Harry is chatting with everyone in Flourish and Blots, and then after a fade to black, leaves the now empty bookshop alone, and Ron meets to tell him that the train has gone? Meanwhile, in the PS2 version, it makes even less sense because it's locked Lockhart blathering on at Harry that makes them miss the train, which happens at the same time that literally everyone was still in the bookshop. Plus Lockhart will also miss the train now, and it's his fault. What? Luckily for Hogwarts Legacy, it doesn't have to deal with cramming in a pre-made story into a tiny development period. Instead, they were able to build the story from the ground up and incorporate it as they pleased. And indeed, here we have a story that is more ingrained into the game world and your interaction with it. We have a whole bunch of side quests that tell us more about the state of the wizarding world and people's attitude towards it. Some quests directly deal with the repercussions of the main story with Ranrock and his loyalists, and you of course come across their many camps throughout the world, adding to the idea that shit is really going down. Some of the older games had a bit of extra story embellishment, like some of the Order of the Phoenix side quests definitely added to my idea of what that version of Hogwarts was like, but generally they were not so generous with the extra story elements. As well as quests, there are the typical RPG random pages lying about the place to read, which yeah, I'm, I'm not reading all that. I'm not going to pretend that I'm heavily invested in the story or find it amazing or whatever. I kind of dislike the whole Chosen One plotline that kind of just makes you feel like Harry Potter but in the 1800s. Having said that though, the story of the world is far more evident than in the games previously, and so I can't bash their attempts at delivery that much. <laughs> The older games were pretty linear, where spell lessons and story moments alternated, with some of the games having a variety of smaller tasks or challenges intermingled with the main quest, like dueling, quidditch, wizard card hunting, doxy exterminating. This felt like a reasonably satisfying approach, leaving you to blast your way through the story if you just want to find out who the bloody heir of Slytherin is. Obviously, it's fucking sassy camp gay Tom Riddle, come on. It is me, Harry. Ginny told me all about you or the option to take it slow, explore, no need to rush. Calm down, is relaxation, chill out, stop screaming. Hogwarts Legacy does take a similar approach for the most part, like you can go ahead and make your way through the main quest with reasonable speed. You also have a bunch of side tasks to do, ranging from passive collectathons like the Lumos Moth Hunt, field guide pages, the Merlin Trials. The teachers also set you extra lessons, where after completing a couple of tasks that help you understand the potion plants, or flying a bit better, they will teach you a new spell. These are mostly fine, like it's a bit annoying having to buy some seeds to grow some plants, and then having to go and use them on an enemy, but hey, that's cool I guess. And it actually does force you to use the stuff that the game offers, some of which I actually found useful. Chinese chomping cabbage. I choose you! However, the side quests do range in quality 
from emotional story-driven moments to boring delivery boy fetch quests. One of my favourite side quests was one that honestly probably no one else even remembers, Troll Control. I encountered this reasonably early on into my game. I think I had probably just gotten the broom and was exploring around when in Brockborough I met Alexandra Ricketts, horrible name, who had been trying to train a troll to protect the hamlet from Ranrock's loyalists, but trolls being trolls, the giant creature has just been causing havoc on its own and the villagers want it gone. You have to admire Alexandra's unusual and ambitious thinking for taking on Ranrock, and I think we've all been in a position where we try to make something better but end up making it far worse. Heading to where she's kept the troll, my first attempt at taking on the beast did not go too well. I was not quite at a high enough level to officially do the quest, but thought I'd give it a go, but um, yeah, I was nowhere near experienced enough with combat for this yet. Leaving it for a bit and coming back during another playthrough, I felt more confident at combat and although I was still technically lower level than suggested, I slowly chipped away at the troll's health over the course of however many minutes. It felt good, a real challenge in dodging and reacting to the troll's attacks. Finally, the troll was defeated. I felt really satisfied and collected my troll bogey prize. But before I headed back to Alexandra, I had a look in the nearby hut, found a note written by Alexandra and was completely flawed. She'd been trying to teach the troll manners to say please and thank you and how to pronounce words properly. I just felt so sad. Niche, but honestly kind of a similar feeling to when in the Powerpuff Girls, they make a fourth sister who is a bit weird, but then she ends up saving the world, but dies in the process. Kind of like that. Like this kind of grief stemming from loss and misunderstanding. And I think obviously they put this in probably as a kind of jokey thing like haha she's trying to teach the troll English but man I just felt so sad. Who wins overall? Honestly not sure. The older games were lacking in side quests but here sometimes it can just be too <coughs> much. Draw? <sighs> Most of the visual appeal of both the old games and Hogwarts Legacy comes from Hogwarts, spellcasting and creatures. Hogwarts in Hogwarts Legacy is vast, intricate and varied in its architecture and design, taking influence from the films, the books and elsewhere. It is by far the most diverse interpretation of the castle we've seen thus far. I've briefly spoken about it in my initial trailer breakdown, but now we've got to fully explore Hogwarts. I can say that actually, even though I was skeptical at first, I really enjoy the mix of styles Hogwarts Legacy presents us with. From the classical gothic cathedral, marble clad bank, art nouveau windows, dark red wooden Tudor corridors, wooden pagan but also like 1920s electricity. It's like a whole mishmash but honestly kind of works. Like it definitely helps with remembering locations and working out where you are even if this place just wouldn't exist in real life but uh Hey, it's a magic, right? And actually, looking back to the old games, it's not like they didn't have their mix too. From barnyards to underground lakes of toxic green goo, dark medieval towers, and never-ending Victorian greenhouses. Literally, where the fuck is this all fitting? In both Hogwarts of new and old, a lot is taken from medieval gothic churches and castles, which I feel gives the castle a nice grounding, even with all the extra embellishments this new interpretation brings. Hogwarts Legacy's castle isn't giving me the classic Hogwarts look of the films, aside from the parts that are obviously referencing specific places in the film, but more of a fantasy, stylized, arty presentation. It's still very much enjoyable and doesn't take me too much out of the illusion that we're in a big wizard school, but <laughs> it. if it means I can find my way around, I'm fine with new age trippy star fields and fancy French looking dormitories. The architecture elsewhere in the game is mostly just like small little hamlets and villages with nothing too much of note. A few places do look special and unique though, like Pit Upon Ford I quite liked, but most are a bit generic medieval. The trials and ancient magic stuff is nice though, all blue glass and gold, and definitely unique. Unlike anything else in the game, almost feels a bit Halo, sort of Forerunner-esque, with tall, long, narrow rooms. Looking at the spell casting, yeah, the spell casting looks amazing at Hogwarts Legacy, obviously. But let's be honest, a lot of it is great in the old games too. The magic sparkles of the PC games, the spellbook learning magic of the PS2 games, hell, even the fire and particle effects were alright in the old games. And moving on to creature and enemy design briefly, the ancient magic knights give me big Harry Potter 3 boss fight energy, with these dark-souled medieval but also kind of Victorian iron vibes. 
love it. Most of the other enemies are kind of boring, and most of them are just like people or goblins, but the cute magical creatures you can capture, uh, sorry, I mean, um, rescue from the poachers do look quite nice. The blue jobinoles being a tropical looking highlight for me. Overall though, while from a technical level the visuals in Hogwarts Legacy are obviously better and a lot of the time completely out of this world, I can't agree that the visual design is any better in Hogwarts Legacy than in a lot of the older games, which I believe truly captured the magic of the world with its Hogwarts design, beautiful spell casting, and weird and wacky creatures. Although maybe not all the games are as good. Hello there, Harry. Now, the music in the older Harry Potter games is, I know, loved by many, and still packs a punch to this day. I personally listen to the Chamber of Secrets soundtrack all the time, and hell, a track from Order of the Phoenix game was even played during an episode of this season's The Apprentice. Vegan, vegan. The, the early Harry Potter games were lucky in that most of the music was composed before the first film came out, and so it didn't have to emulate John Williams' score so directly. The further on in the timeline we get, the games got more and more realistic, with characters looking like freaky versions of their counterparts, and the music also got more cinematic and Harry Potter-esque in style, but was generally still pretty effective. Hogwarts Legacy had big boost to fill, with a vast amount of video game and movie music to reference. Overall, the music is good. I would say not quite hitting as hard as the older games music, almost certainly my nostalgia's fault, but it does hold a few surprises up its sleeves. With three composers, it's amazing the soundtrack feels as cohesive as it does, but with the work of John Williams deep within its backbone to give the player a sprinkle of Potter magic every now and then, it definitely gives the game a cinematic feeling to match the visuals. Every now and then, there are direct references to the music of the films, little cues from Hedwig's theme. Akio. Most of the music, I would say, is not especially notable or memorable though. Because there's not a lot of majorly repeating short themes, I found it hard to really recall specific pieces from the game. Or at least, that was my thinking, until I unlocked the Vivarium. The music in this section completely took me to a place I hadn't been for like a decade. The piece, A Fitting New Home, by J. Scott Riccosi, is Thomas Newman meets John Williams, with a bouncy Potter opening turning into lush, peaceful, reflective strings strings and piano. I was taken right back to Finding Nemo and Lemony Snicket series on Fortunate Events film, the score composed by Thomas Newman, who fun fact was the first person to write the music for a Pixar film that wasn't Randy Newman, who is actually Thomas Newman's cousin, I think that's true. This was a completely unexpected hit of nostalgia that took me by surprise. Since then, I've come to understand and appreciate the music a lot more in the game. There are a lot of other musical references and highlights in the game, like the Debussy inspired Slytherin common room tune. The music also makes some great moments in the game, like after I completed the troll quest I mentioned before, I flew away on my broom, and the music that played was quiet and reflective, amplifying my introspective state at that time. It was the perfect end to that quest that left me feeling empty, but in a good way. I think I understand more that the music has, can, and will affect people in many different ways, and that there's something for everyone within the soundtrack of this game. Why are there no gnomes in Hogwarts Legacy? Hmm? Where are the gnomes? As deputy headmistress, it is my distinct honour to show you to your common room. Right this way. You were going to Dumbledore, weren't you? 
Very well. The Cruciatus curse ought to loosen your tongue. No. Oh. This is impossible. Ah. Oh. Uh. Learning spells in Hogwarts Legacy is honestly a bit of a throwback to the games of old. Each spell doesn't have a symbol per se, instead being depicted by a pictogram, which is, you know, fair enough. Some of the symbols in the old games were very distinctive and made sense, like Spongify being a spring and Lumos being a glowing moon, but some did just feel kind of random, like Flippendo, as iconic as it is, it's, it's just a swell. And Expelliarmus is a bottle, like what's up with that? Oh, it's supposed to be a bat to hit spells back with. It's a bat! The little illustrations in Hogwarts Legacy are actually pretty good, with most of them being good descriptors of what the spell does. To learn the spell, however, you do have to perform the wand gesture in a way that nicely combines the previous ways of learning, where the first game on PC had you trace the spell with your mouse, and the second game on PC had you tap the arrow keys in time to a wand making its way around the symbol. Hogwarts Legacy has you drag an arrow around the symbol, tapping the corresponding buttons to give the arrow some acceleration. This on-rails approach is definitely like an easier version of the first game, which it was pretty stressful. But there's still a bit of panic in the new one that if you take too long getting around the corners you still might not make it, and hey, at least it doesn't expect you to have proper mouse-eye coordination. Like weren't most people playing that game super young? Far too much to expect. Not sure who wins. A draw? <laughs> The various Harry Potter games have had different approaches to casting spells, from the PS1's Flippendo as the default spell, with the other spells context sensitive, the PC's one button does everything approach, and the love it or hate it, but you gotta admit it's kind of realistic, motion controls of Order of the Phoenix. Hogwarts Legacy ends up taking an approach similar to that of the PS2 era games, where spells and actions are assigned to the symbol buttons, but whereas those games let you have like only two or three bloody spells equipped, Hogwarts Legacy does give you just a bit more choice. Here you have some default spells and actions like Protego on the triangle or Y, and your basic flippendo-like attack spell on the right trigger. Holding the left trigger however acts like a shift key that changes the symbol buttons into your custom spells, where up to four can be equipped at a time. You also can have up to four of these loadouts unlocked using the talent system leading to 16 custom spells available to you with the press of a few buttons. This approach is as perfect as a system as you're gonna get on console that doesn't just utilise an immersion breaking weapon wheel, like we end up having for your objects and potions for use during battle, but whatever. It's a lot better of an approach than the PS2 games had, and honestly, I can't really think of a better way of doing it. Spellcasting in general is also a lot of fun. Using Accio to reel in a page feels like fishing. I almost want to lean back as I pull a page in. Dueling is also challenging, exciting and exhilarating, being no easy task nearer to the start of the game. Having to look out for incoming attacks with the gold halo is a nice way of not just having to protego up constantly, but actually making it feel like you're actively engaging. Unlike in Order of the Phoenix where I had no bloody clue what I was doing most of the time. Compos encourage you to use different spells and experiment, building up your ancient magic ability which lets you kill most enemies in a single hit. Would have been nice actually to have something like in the fourth game where you have an uber charge that deals a greatly increased amount of damage with each hit. Yes I'm complimenting something about the fourth game, send me to jail, go on. But to be honest, in Hogwarts Legacy individual enemies aren't so hard to fight, but multiple enemy battles can be overwhelming, so taking out a single enemy completely is potentially preferable. Terrible. During fast paced battles, I did find it a bit overwhelming to swap spell loadouts and cast my other spells, but to be honest, if anything, that makes the game more realistic. Like, combat should be a bit of a challenge for a fifth year. Although apparently not challenging enough to kill off hundreds and hundreds of murderous goblins, venomous spiders, and fully grown human adults who, let's be honest, should not be challenged by a spotty teenager. Also, not gonna lie, I find the morals of attacking and killing so many people a bit weird. Like, sure, you've stopped a bunch of guys from catching and skinning some mongrels, but like, you've literally murdered human people. Plus, you went and killed the dark mongrels and took their fur anyway. The beasts around here can sleep a bit easier now. 
Flying in Hogwarts Legacy is a vast improvement on the various flying mechanics we've had in the older games, and trust me, there's been a lot of different mechanics throughout the games, from the on-rails Quidditch of the second game on PC, to the stressful freeform flying of Philosopher's Stone, <laughs> and even a Flappy Bird inspired Hippogriff from Prisoner of Azkaban. While the flying is not completely perfect, and the controls can be a bit confusing at times, I'm not quite sure why there seems to be like three ways of accelerating, but it's by far the most freeing version of flying we've had so far, and getting to explore all of the grounds by broom is extremely satisfying. The balloons you can pop throughout the world are cute, and sure, it's a shame there's no Quidditch, but let's be honest, I think the game has enough going on already. Also go and play Quidditch World Cup, it's like FIFA but for Quidditch, honestly it's amazing. <sighs> Hogwarts Legacy. Where are the secrets? One of the greatest and most satisfying parts of the older games, especially the PC games, was the vast amount of secret areas hidden behind bookcases, stone walls, portraits, holes in the floor, revealed by Lumos, flippendo buttons, or simply jumping through paintings and hoping you aren't about to tear through a priceless magic work of art. And what do we have here though? Revelio. And that's kind of it. There are a couple of examples of secrets here, like this owl flip panel and these frog things, although I'd hardly count these as secrets when they're the most obvious things in the room. There are also a few bits where rubble or stones that block the way to a treasure chest can be dislodged with Depulso, but when the reward is an ugly as fuck <laughs> scarf that has lower stats than everything I already own, I'm struggling to see the appeal of there being secret at all to be honest. Let me show you one good bit of exploration and discovery in Hogwarts Legacy. There is a really nice tapestry with a big K written on it that I'd walked past a bunch of times. One time, I cast Revelio and saw all these like blue squares somewhere beyond the tapestry, but not so far that they would be in a different area. I had a look around, and from the staircase leading to this area, I noticed a corridor behind where the tapestry was. Revelio didn't suggest the tapestry could be cast on or anything, so instead I just tried walking up to it, and ended up discovering that there's actually a hidden door right in the centre. This felt amazing. I felt like I'd uncovered this super secret area that you had to use deduction to find. It was almost like in the Spongify challenge in the PC game, where that one painting makes your spell crosshair disappear, and walking into the painting you realise you can just walk straight through the canvas. So good. A shame that in Hogwarts Legacy the minimap gives away the fact there's a secret corridor behind the tapestry. Oh, I don't know, I just feel a bit frustrated that this game doesn't seem to want you to find stuff out on your own. Like even the characters blather away revealing the solutions to puzzles before you've had a chance to work them out. It would have been much more satisfying and immersive if the game actually put some not so obvious secrets in, so it feels like you were the first person in decades to find a secret room behind a statue or a passage behind a tapestry. But Ugh, whatever. <sighs> Where the old games had many a collectible, such as beans, cards, shields, stars, quidditch equipment, blah 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 blah. Beans! Hogwarts Legacy somewhat reflects these with its own range of objects that the player can find all over the castle and surrounding world. The field pages, in my opinion, act as a suitable substitute for the wizard cards of old, where they are hidden in plain sight in front of notable objects or places throughout the world. I really love that they are found in front of the object that they represent, unlike the wizard cards, which generally didn't seem to have links to their location, and while sure you could just spam Revelio everywhere you go, which I have definitely done, I think knowing they are linked to special places means you are more inclined to look at your surroundings, think hmm this statue looks kind of significant, or there's definitely one hidden somewhere in the Great Hall, and then cast Revelio to find out if your intuition was right. I think this system is pretty great actually, and in my opinion more satisfying in some ways than finding a card in a chest. Aside from these pages, we do have a few few other items. Your clothes are found in chests and bags across the world, and while unlocking new outfits can be cool, they are provided in a rather disposable RPG way, where they instantly clog up your virtual wardrobe and need to be sold every 30 bloody seconds to leave space to pick up even more fast fashion at its finest. I like the idea of finding new visual styles to wear, but having to equip a new piece of clothing to gain its additional 3 defence points, and then changing its appearance back to what you were wearing before is it's just a waste of time, let's be honest. I just I just personally don't think it fits with the world of Harry Potter, having stats tied to your appearance, 
but whatever. You can also find other items in chests to add to your little home in the room of requirement, which I won't lie, I didn't really care about to be honest. Although it was fabulous to see my favourite little devil guy being depicted on the potions cauldron. It's just not the same when you open a chest and it tells you you've gotten a magic chest of drawers compared to the older games when the actual object would come flying out. Besides these kind of items, there are a bunch of other challenges or quests that kind of feel like collectathons, such as finding all the demoguises, the starry tables, all the fun animals. For me, I honestly just found it a bit overwhelming, but I can't deny that they've definitely gone all out with stuff for the player to find, so there's definitely something for the collectathon fans out there. It's just not the same without wizard cards though, is it? <laughs> Now, this might be a controversial opinion, I'm not sure, but playing Hogwarts Legacy, I'm not sure how much I felt like I was a student at Hogwarts. Don't get me wrong, exploring Hogwarts is magical, but your character only just joins in their fifth year, the lessons seem a bit rushed, the spells don't really line up with the teachers, with not much learning even beyond acquiring the spells and maybe practicing once or twice, and your character can also dress basically as they please, like everyone else am I right? Of course, your character has a bunch of special tasks and missions to complete, much like Harry did, but I feel like the older games have a bunch of stuff that also makes you feel like you're a normal student at the school too, like trading with fellow students, receiving house points, failing to get enough house points to attend the bean bonus room. Really, the closest you get here is to helping out the other students with their random tasks, but apart from the seasons changing, I don't really feel like I'm contributing to the school year. The constant exploring of the vast acres of land outside of Hogwarts doesn't exactly go hand in hand with being a student at Hogwarts, where most students would probably have spent most of their time in the castle, maybe in Hogsmeade or the grounds of the castle and a bit beyond, but personally I don't imagine them delivering invisibility potions to some random cellar in some random hamlet miles away from anywhere where anything is happening. Sent a child to do his work for him, did he? Just doesn't seem like something a student at Hogwarts would do? You have your brother for him as well. I do see this kind of stuff as the game trying to be more like The Witcher 3, and I <laughs> love The Witcher 3. But here, I don't know about that. Similarly with Hogsmeade, it's definitely just the capitalism, capitalism hub of the game, where besides the odd quest here and there, seems only to exist to have an excuse to add trading into the game, as well as being literally the coziest place in the universe, am I right? It feels like the game is trying so hard to make you both a student who's at Hogwarts to learn, explore the castle, and do stuff that Dumbledore, so sorry, I mean Professor Fig, tells you to do, but also to be an adult that goes off exploring the vast world on their own, taking on whole gangs of bandits and giant spiders, I just, I just don't think it gels together super well. Also, f you not being able to interact with the flu flames. Like, come on, why do I have to press that map button? I should be able to press X when I'm at the bloody flu flame. That's how the flu powder system works. The students flying kites is cute though. And thus concludes our fight for this evening. A tough battle all around, wouldn't you agree? And the winner? Um, Lego creator Harry Potter? Getting letters. Obviously, the older games have a lot of flaws, but so does Hogwarts Legacy, but both also truly capture the magic of Hogwarts. Which is better? I don't know, you're gonna have to decide that for yourself. But obviously, the Chamber of Secrets PC game is far better than any other game ever. One of the glimmers in the Discord server, feel free to join if you haven't done so already, link below, summarised it very nicely. I feel like it's incomparable. The old games were games games, if you know what I mean. This one is more of a museum for fans, with an okay story and decent combat sprinkled on top, and I can't help but feel that this is a pretty good summary of my thoughts. Is Hogwarts Legacy perfect? No. Does it capture the magic of Hogwarts and the Wizarding World? Absolutely. Am I sad that it doesn't have any gnomes? Honey, you already know the answer. Thank you so much for watching and listening to my thoughts, I hope you enjoyed. If you were a big fan of the older Harry Potter games, I have some fantastic gnome t-shirts designed by yours truly for sale. I also have a Patreon, where if you subscribe for three months I'm giving away some lovely wizard cards of me. I have a Discord server full of people who are just as passionate about the old games as me and, let's be honest, probably you. And while you're at it, why not follow me on my socials and subscribe here? Still got plenty of Harry Potter games to cover. I also stream about once a week, so look out for that. But for now, 
Thank you once again, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye! Ooh, the bells are cool. I don't think I've ever noticed them before. That's nice. Can you hear? Like, this ambience, gorgeous. Wow.